visibility is just key for safety, especially in a school zone. So I was having trouble keeping people from parking too close to the uh, intersections, the crosswalks. Um, so I was spending all my time kind of shooing people away. And I thought, and just because they did not realize like kind of the safety hazards that can create. So I, I not only started using cones to keep people out of, uh, out of visibility issues uh, away from the intersections, but then I decided I can even do more um, and started creating these chicanes, forcing people to slow down uh, because I, you know, I used to have a, a little 10 mile an hour sign there and that wasn't working. <laughs> so I decided rather than ask people to slow down and I was going to force them to slow down. So chicane, you know, is just kind of a little bend in the road and it just uh, makes people slow down and take the, the turns and uh, go through the intersection a little bit slower. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman and that is Nicole McSpirit from Denver, Colorado. We're gonna be talking about her job as a crossing guard at the local elementary school where her kids once went to school and also how she got radicalized as a everyday utilitarian cyclist and advocate for safer streets. It is a good one, so let's get right to it with Nicole. Enjoy. Nicole, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me here. So, Nicole, I love having my guests uh, just share a little bit about themselves. Uh, so who is Nicole? Well, I guess, you know, as it's kind of confusing as it is, um, I'm someone who, who grew up um, thinking that, uh, you know, taking a bike and walking was normal, you know, growing up in the 70s and 80s. But uh, then, like many people, just became very car-centric and needed a car to get everywhere. Um, then when I realized that wasn't really working for me anymore or my community, um, I decided to make a change. And this is just kind of the process that I've been going through, being inspired by different things, um, kind of being involved with advocacy groups. So, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm muddling my way through this, trying to kind of help other people discover the benefits of active mobility and improve the safety of our streets. Fantastic. Now, where did you grow up? I grew up in New Orleans, Okay. which is a very, like, there's a high ridership in New Orleans, mainly because of poverty issues. Yeah. Uh, when I was riding a bike there, there were no bike lanes or anything. I just stuck to small side streets. And um, even when I, you know, I, I rode my bike to school and back and to my friends, to my grandparents' house. Um, which all was pretty close. But um, even when I ended up getting a car and getting older, I rode my bike a lot because I worked in the French Quarter where parking was just not happening. So it, it made sense doing that. But um, kind of rediscovering that love of, of biking for transportation um, in my later years. Yeah, 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 for sure. Now, um, the other neat thing about uh, New Orleans that I love is that the relationship to the street is just completely different there because they're always occupying the street space. Yeah. Well, and it is um, because of the water table issues. Um, there's The streets are pretty rough a lot of times. So a lot of times you'll see drivers going very slow. So And it's more of a shared space and it's narrower. You know, they're old streets. Um, I think I would love to see the French Quarter be completely pedestrianized. It kind of needs that, I think, with the damage that a lot of the bigger vehicles coming through is doing. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's a different, it's a different um, atmosphere there. There's there's more people out biking, so that it's just more common for for drivers to kind of pay attention. Not that it they have their safety issues there right. as well, like anywhere. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely different than some other places in the United States. Yeah, yeah. I've had this conversation with uh, folks from New Orleans uh, that I've had on the podcast before. And, and it's like, yeah, it, it's like when you have a different relationship to your street and there's always a street party, there's always a parade, there's, it, you know, there's stuff going on. And so it reinforces that idea that streets are not just for cars. They literally are for people. And you know, Correct. they've been around for thousands of years, much longer than cars have. And so it's the one city that I can think of in North America where that sort of, that ownership of the street is is just 
yeah, oh no, this is our street. <laughs> it is. And, you yeah. know, you're used to that. Uh, if you're a yeah. driver in New Orleans, you're like, oh, I have to detour, you know, like, but it's, it's part of life. It, it's not, you know, here where people just kind of lose their minds if there's a race and the road gets closed for a little while. Um, it's just a normal part of life. Um, and people walk in the streets and, you know, you just kind of, there mainly because a lot of our sidewalks are, are also kind of not not the best in New Orleans. So you're just used to sharing space a, a bit more. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and just recently um, there in Denver, uh, just the day before NACDO, you guys had mm-hmm. Aviva Streets. And so you had that opportunity yeah. to, uh, you know, to experience that as well, which is something that's so incredibly important, I think, for from a North American perspective is for open streets events to happen, because, again, it helps in that process of trying to help people, community members imagine what streets can be for other than just driving a motor vehicle as fast as possible. Yeah, it was um, really amazing. Uh, Just an amazing experience. My face hurt the next day from so much smiling. I think like everyone else, you know, a lot of times we um, did not bike on those streets that we were had open to everyone because they were not the most pleasant. So I noticed shops that I had never noticed before. Um, It just having a different perspective and just the peace and quiet. Um, All you heard were laughs and, you know, bike bells ringing and people laughing and some music. Um, it was, it was a, a really just amazing experience for all involved. And thanks for all the, like the, the, all the, um, all the people volunteering that made it happen. It, it took a lot of work, um, to, to do this and it, they just made it so pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so wonderful that it was literally the day before the NACTO conference, the design NACTO designing cities conference mm-hmm. uh, was taking place there in the downtown Denver area at the uh, convention center. Uh, we had uh, street films represented there with uh, Clarence Eckerson Jr. Um, was also there to film. And so he was able to capture Viva Streets. Uh, folks, if you haven't seen the Viva Streets uh, video that uh, Clarence put together is super, super fun, as they always are. And uh yeah, I, it was just, I was so stoked that A, NACTA was happening in Denver and that Viva Streets was going to happen um, the day before. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention, there's more. There's uh, several other mm-hmm. dates. And so we've got July 9th and also August 6th coming up. Uh, so if you missed that first Viva Streets in May uh, and you're from the Denver area, make sure that you uh, m- try to make it to the other ones. Uh, I'm not even sure when this episode's going to be going out. So it, it may oh, be yeah. the next one is July 9th. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> well, I'll be there, which, you know, no matter which Either one's there, way, you're going to be there. That you're going to be there. I, I love that you said that, though, that you're, 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 your face was just hurting because you were smiling so much. Uh, it, it, it's... For those people who haven't experienced an open streets, um, can you kind of summarize what is so special about them? Well, you know, biking for transportation has its own joys. I mean, there's just a joy in getting out there and being a part of your community, um, really kind of traveling through and seeing things. But um, we all have to pass the uh, across these busy arterials and we're constantly looking over our shoulder and being wary of our surroundings. And if you're in a bike rent lane, that's great, you know, protected bike lane. Um, but still, then you're probably going single file with the people you're with. And it's not very social. So this at one point during Viva Streets, we were four abreast and we were laughing and talking and waving to people and ringing our bells. And it was it was literally just kind of like, ah, kind of we were all just just completely amazed by the, the joy that we saw everyone experiencing. And it's yeah. contagious too. I've oh, seen yeah, kid, no. <laughs> seeing kids out there scootering and biking and they can weave, you know, they because you know they're they're wobbly or whatever, you know, you can give them space. It wasn't um so like restricted. You could actually just go out there and enjoy yourself. And people rollerblading and just, you know, just enjoying the street that we so infrequently get to enjoy. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I try to make it up to uh, at least one event up in Fort Collins uh, each each summer. So um, I'm going to look at the schedule and see if I can actually coordinate with uh, one of the Viva Streets and one of the uh, Sunday events uh, that you, typically happens up in Fort Collins. Uh, last year, I was able to catch the uh, the Tour de Fat on one weekend uh-huh. uh, up in Fort Collins and then the following weekend, or maybe it was the other way around, I was able to, to, to catch the, uh, the Sunday open streets event there. So uh, it's super uh, empowering and powerful because it helps again, as I said earlier, reframe mm-hmm. a community's idea of what a street is for. So we have never met in person, but we have been, you know, sort of <laughs> in touch with uh, via via Twitter. And so mm-hmm. going Dutch, D-E-N, Fietzer Nicole is is your handle out right. on Twitter. Um, and, and you and I, before we, we hit the record button, we were talking a little bit about my good friend, uh, Brandon Lust, uh, American Feetzer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he gets a chuckle of, of the, the increased number of people who are on Twitter now with the Feetzer uh, nomenclature oh, yeah. and name. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, going Dutch Denver. Where, where did this come from? Well, it, it really came from, you know, meet me. me trying in my little way to kind of become a bicyclist here or like be, be a person who used a bike for transportation in Denver. Um, and it was tough, you know, like I just, I would stay pretty much in my neighborhood um, and not be, you know, not able to go too far away, you know, having to pass these, these large arterials that were scary, um, you know, and, and not very, not very pleasant. There we go. Uh, and so I just, when I, I went to the Netherlands for the first time, I was, had my mind blown um, and decided that I was going to come back and, and do something about it to, to try to promote that kind of activity here, um, knowing that I was not going to have a chance to, to move to the Netherlands anytime soon. I have two, um, you know, at the time, teenager and young adult daughters uh, who I weren't, wasn't going to leave. But just kind of wanted to bring some of that here, what I what I kind of was amazed by. In fact, the first time I went to Amsterdam, I didn't even ride a bike. I just watched. I walked everywhere, but I like just would sit and, and watch and be amazed by this almost, um, it almost seemed like they were kind of this unified element of, of just like weaving in and out and just so perfectly kind of cohabitating um you know no no stop signs no you know just everyone just kind of was going about their business and using um you know like eye contact and body language to let you know where where they were going um so yeah and so i I definitely ride a a dutch bicycle this is my um, e-bike which i am this close to getting 4,000 miles on, um, I ordered straight from the Netherlands because I really could not find anything that suited me here. Um, there are a few more options now, um, but even the Gazelle uh, U.S. market bikes aren't quite as upright. Um, right. So this was um, this has been a phenomenal bike for me. Um, it's an a- Azor e-bike, um, like I said, shipped directly from the Netherlands. Um, and, uh, luckily I ordered it and received it right before the, uh, pandemic hit. So it was really kind of something that kept me sane and active during all of that. Um, just kind of, I, I made a lot of masks during the pandemic and would deliver them for free by bike just to have a purpose (laughs) to get out there and ride. Uh, I've never been one that can kind of just go like, I'm just going to go for a bike ride. Um, right. I need a purpose, a destination. Yeah. So that that allowed me to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes the purpose or destination may be, you know, to take a friend out. <laughs> yes. Well, and this is my buddy Vera, who you'll see in a lot of the, the photos and videos uh, if you follow me on Twitter. But um, this was her. She injured her foot. Um, and I needed to take her to the vet and the, she rides all the time, but it kind of, it made it okay for her because she loves the bike. <laughs> um, and if you had to drive, she typically throws up, 
uh, in the car and does not like it. So I wonder where she gets that from. Um, <laughs> but so this was like her way, you know, I was able to take her to the vet um, and, and give her a little bike ride too. So it made all everything that she had to go through kind of okay. <laughs> Yeah, but like, yeah. you know, it shows that you can do like, you know, she's only a 25 pound dog, but there are right. ways of, of transporting kids and, and animals around by bike. Yeah. Yeah. And clearly you ride this bike uh, during cooler temperatures because mm-hmm. what do I spy here? <laughs> yeah. ah, look at yeah, that. So yeah. This is my pogies, which are, yeah. just, they are lifesavers. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have them for all of our bikes because I, you know, wearing thick gloves in the winter makes you kind of, you can't really do much. Um, so having those, those little pogies kind of, even on the coldest days, all I normally have to wear are light gloves and you kind of retain your dexterity. Um, right. And, and they make a huge difference. There, there we yeah. go. That's my real winter <laughs> transport vehicle. <laughs> that that's when we're really, winter. that's when we're really decked yeah. out now. So for many people who may be watching this or listening to this and, and going, uh, and by the way, for those listening, um, we, we, the, the photo that's up on the screen right now is actually really cold weather. So this is, you can see the, the, the snow and ice crystals on the, the glove, the, the pogies there, the bar mitts, and you can see that it's snowing in the background or had snowed and it's, it looks like a very, very cold environment. Talk a little bit about this. I mean, from New Orleans. I know. <laughs> you know I, it's, you know, for many people, this may seem extreme, you know, and like, oh, gosh, well, I don't want it to be that difficult or that hard. It's just, you know, I don't don't be offended by me saying this, but, you know, it's just a normal person going about their normal day activity and using a bike for for everyday purposes. Why would you subject yourself to this? Is, you know, is there something about um, getting out there and riding on a day like this day that is special for you? Well, yeah. And part of it is just saying I did it. You know, like um, we had a very long and tough winter here in Denver. We saw a lot more snow, we had a lot colder weathers. I think if I'm right, this was about six degrees Um but again, you know, like if you have the right kind of bike and equipment, I, you know, I wasn't cold. You know, I wouldn't have done it if I was freezing. Uh, and this is probably, I think this is on my way back from my crossing guard shift that I work at a local elementary school, which is not far away. Like I, this winter, I still rode, but I wasn't going huge distances just because of the conditions of the road a lot of times. So I'm, I'm outstanding in this weather for half an hour, 40 minutes. So I have to dress warm anyway. Um, and it was just easier to kind of, to jump on my bike and go. Um, and especially when you have the right gear, um, it, it's really, it's not that much of a hardship or, you know, it's still nicer than driving. Like I've never enjoyed driving in the winter either. Um, so this was fine. Uh, you know, it, I definitely did not do as much riding in the winter. It, uh, that, that kind of sucked to not being able to go to the distances and, and the places that I would have liked to go, but it, it was fine. Like I, I just kind of learned to love it. And yeah, I never, never considered myself ever doing something like this growing up in New Orleans. Uh, but I have to tell you, I've never been as cold as I've been in New Orleans when it's like 28 degrees because the humidity there is is, is frigid. So it's really it's really not as tough as it looks. I know it may look horrible there, but it, yeah. but I was toasty and warm. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned distances and not that far a distances. Why don't you put this into context in terms of how far it is for you to, to ride to your, your crossing guard shift? So it's it's a half a mile. So okay. it's and and it actually probably would be shorter because I am literally right off of the um, a, a, a parkway that the street is also off of uh, the school is also off of, but it's on the other side, um, and it's not that pleasant of a street to bike on. People do, but people go regularly pretty fast. So I kind of go a block away and turn up and then block around. So it ends up being about half a mile, but, and I I would still ride 
to the grocery store, which is about a mile away. Um, but I wasn't going across town regularly, mainly because I didn't know what the conditions were there. And I really have no bike infrastructure in my neighborhood. It's all side streets. So it kind of really can be sketchy at times. There was some sidewalk riding I did this winter because I literally had no other option. Um, not that I enjoy doing that, but you know, right. You, you got to stay upright. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Now it, we're going to do some more bike uh, photos here just because you sent okay. along a few bike photos. <laughs> so, Oh no, this is a different bike. That is. So that is my first, well, actually, no, sec, uh, second Dutch bicycle. This is my one that I ordered from uh, J, uh, was it J.D. Lind in Chicago. Okay. Um, it's a work cycles. And it really is what kind of started me on, be, like, being able to, to see exactly what I could do. You know, I, I have a small eBay business, and a lot of times I would have to go mail a lot of packages and more than like maybe the, a normal bike, whatever that is, um, could carry. Um, but with the, this bike, um, as as does my e-bike, has a front rack that holds quite a bit. You know, you have panniers that hold quite a bit. So it just kind of, it really kind of made me see that ability to, to do more things, get groceries, buy bike, you know, go to the nursery center and, and buy plants and things like that. And so it just, you know, it, it makes you kind of realize how much more you can do by bike that you just automatically assume you would need a car for. Yeah. Yeah. So, but and this, this, this the, I, it, I rode for about a year. Okay. Uh, and then I decided I needed uh, electric assist if I wanted to ride even right. more. Yeah. Ride even more. And this is a, is definitely a workhorse. I'm, I'm, I'm I was mm -hmm. delighted to see this and it's a, it's a work cycles yes. bike. And, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet with uh, Henry Cutler at the work cycles uh, headquarters there in Amsterdam. And, and in fact, Jason Slaughter with not just bikes delivered me to his doorstep, which was wow. really fun. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and again, uh, uh, we mentioned him earlier, Brandon Lust, uh, with, with American Feetster. He also has a work cycles and, and it helped really really kind of reframe that whole concept of, oh yeah, you know, you can do everyday tasks on these, uh, on these, you know, devices, on these, you know, tools, uh, they're mobility devices and they're very, very practical and functional. And so it's, it's good uh, absolutely. Stuff. And, and something I haven't touched on is, um, so I do have some mobility restrictions. Uh, when I was 13, I had surgery, back surgery for scoliosis so um, I had a, a metal rod in, inserted into my spine, which, you know, kind of limits my mobility. And then I end up turn, twisting my neck and my lower back too much because that's where uh, the only places I have flexibility. So there were quite a few years where like regular American bikes were just uncomfortable that, you know, leaning forward, your head lifted up to see just was not working for me. So when I discovered true Dutch bikes that you are sitting upright. Um, it, it, it made a lot of difference like this. It was comfortable. It felt safer because I had better visibility, turning my neck around, seeing who was there. So I, in those ways, I also kind of really push for people to, to look for Dutch bikes or like super upright, um, comfortable bikes because it really makes a difference. Yeah. yeah. Like this. Yeah. yeah a turn. Absolutely. A, yep. Yeah. So this, yeah. um, we, we had the great e-bike rebate here in Denver, um, and I was able to purchase this bike, which this was is my winter bike, um, which because the lower center of gravity really helps keep your balance on snow. But this um, is also a shareable family bike because it is kind of fits all different sizes. And it's my loner bike. So whenever I take someone out who kind of wants to get more comfortable riding, wants to see if this is for them, um, this is the bike that they get to, to borrow just to kind of come out and experience it. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I, I also have a turn, I have a GSD and, and just mm -hmm. absolutely love it. It's again, it's a workhorse. It can, I can load that thing down with, uh, you know, 
pounds and pounds and pounds and kilograms of, oh, of yeah. groceries and it's fine as well it as I can a take challenge. an challenge. Well, that and, and I can take an adult for a, a ride too mm-hmm. because I've got it set up uh, with the back seat there and, and that's that's quite fun to be able to do that. And I love that you mentioned that it's it, that you know it's it's adjustable. You can have other people be able to ride on it. Becomes like a family bike as well as it can be become a a, a loner bike for for somebody who needs one. And, and I think that's uh, important. We're, we're going to do a tour of bikes here. And this one, I think I recognize that this is uh, probably in New Orleans, right? It is. So yeah. that was um, that was one of the blue bikes. They went away for a while, but I believe yep. they're back now. But yeah, this was my husband's first Jazz Fest and my ah. first in many years. And this was another sense of joy where we just hundreds of people riding to jazz fest together you know people with coolers strapped onto their bikes with um folding chairs strapped on their backs um, yeah. just kind of all riding in the same direction we, we all knew where we were going um and it, it was and it's, it is it's a great place to ride a bike yeah yeah if you watch out for the potholes yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly and, and i love the hat action too which is another great thing that i can remember of my time in new orleans is is you know, there's you a, a sense a of, of style and flair to yeah. it and, and all that good stuff well, it's practical too because boy yeah. it gets hot and that sun's beating down on you <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so you have a, a fairly active scene there in Denver. Uh, again, striving to do what you can to take back the streets and give it to people. Um, I've actually been on on the street uh, for parking day in the past there in Denver. So I have uh, filmed and I have a, a video on parking day. I, I think it's up on YouTube, but maybe, maybe not. I'll have to double check on that. Uh, is that what's happening here? Is this a parking day? It, it is. So my okay. friend Devin here in the plaid shirt um, organized this, but I had a, uh, yeah, I had a solar generator and this was like our fueling station our, of the future. So, you know, using solar energy to, to recharge, we gave free charges to everyone who came by. Um, and it, yeah, it was just another kind of move in this kind of, you know, make people rethink the street space and how easily we could kind of switch to having bikes be a more common scene on our streets. And they are, but yeah, yeah, exactly. And then here's like a little sustainability uh, is booth. Is this a a different event? Yes, it is. So this is right in my neighborhood, Park Hill. Um, The woman you see behind the, the, the table on the right there, um, organize the event well organize some of the event in this this sustainability table so she allowed she gave me a spot and um, I said yes <laughs> absolutely um, and just to promote bikes for climate so we have there like lots of um, little links kind of you are like the the codes the QR codes that people could upload um, the bike streets map uh, and and you know join Denver Bicycle Lobby and uh, Bicycle Colorado and register your bike, uh, bike index. So just trying to kind of help out people um, in any way um, to kind of, you know, if any, if there's any kind of links or obstacles they're facing to try to help them out with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is uh, this is the image from that, and the, uh, mm-hmm. and yes, you've got uh, Bicycle Colorado, which is the statewide advocacy organization. We've featured them here on the podcast as well, and then the Denver Bicycle Lobby, and then the Denver Streets Partnership, um, mm-hmm. which is uh, really the, the that local bike and ped of sort of uh, organization with Jill Locantori, also been on yep. the podcast here before, and then uh, you mentioned uh, you know bike. Bike streets and the bike streets map, and we've got uh, the the initiative, the build Vamos Now uh, yes. initiative, and we've had uh, Avi Stopper on the uh, on the the podcast as well. And then you, you also mentioned the e bike uh, rebate, and we've also featured the e bike uh, rebate here on the the channel, and uh, the, that's the Denver Climate Action and Sustainability and re- Resilience efforts that are going on. And that's what I mean by it seems like there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in Denver at this stage? There really is. I mean, there's still a long way to go, um, especially with these, um, the issue of traffic violence. Um, we're, we're still kind of plugging away. You know, it, it crushes us every time 
we hear about someone else injured or killed on our streets, you know, this is this is what we're working for. Um, and it really will limit how many people feel comfortable being out on our streets um, if we cannot can do more for safety. So, yeah, Denver Streets Partnership has done some great things um, this year and, and past years. But, you know, the the. Um, Denver Deserves Sidewalk Initiative, Bicycle Colorado, you know, implemented the safety stop not uh, too long ago. Uh, so we're definitely moving in the right direction. Of course, it never seems fast enough, um, you know, that what you want to see. But yeah. um, hey, but you know what? There. You know, just like w- with my conversation with Avi, if it's not moving fast enough, hey, take control, throw some cones yeah. out. Let's do let's make That's it happen. It. So talk so, a little yeah, bit this about is- this installation. <laughs> What's going on here? So this is um, at my corner, my crossing guard corner. So this is the elementary school that my kids went to. They are 21 and 25 now, so it's been a little while. But um, I had uh, was out uh, having a beverage with some friends who work there, or used to work there, and old uh, parents. And I found out that the uh, the old crossing guard Mildred had retired, and they said, "Well, why don't you? Why don't you do that?" I'm like, yeah. Maybe I should. <laughs> um, and so this this school year, I have been been there every day, um, and I realized very quickly that I, I needed some cones to help me out because um, you know, as you know, and uh, visibility is just key for safety, especially in a school zone. So I was having trouble keeping people from parking too close to the uh, intersections, the crosswalks. Um, so I was spending all my time kind of shooing people away and I thought, and just because they did not realize like kind of the safety hazards that can create. So I, I not only started using cones f- to keep people out of, uh, out of visibility issues, uh, away from the intersections, but then I decided I can even do more, um, and started creating these chicanes, forcing people to slow down, uh, because I, you know, I used to have a, a little 10 mile an hour sign there and that wasn't working. <laughs> so I decided rather than ask people to slow down and I was going to force them to slow down. So chicane, you know, is just kind of a little bend in the road and it just uh, makes people slow down and take the, the turns and uh, go through the intersection a little bit slower. Um, so this shows kind of how it works here. Um, we'll see people going straight, and then people also now are forced to take a much sharper turn at this intersection, where before they were just kind of cut the corner um, and create a bottleneck here, too, if there was other cars on the street, and then block the crosswalk. So I think I've kind of gotten it down to a bit of a science. And now, you know, you, it's an experimentation. I was talking with Avi about this last time. It's like this constant experimentation like I move a cone here well what if I move it two inches to this side does it work even better you know it's just so it's this constant kind of readjusting and and seeing what works best but um, it, it's worked really well I've gotten overwhelming positive response um, from all the parents and teachers so it, it's been a great great opportunity um, to it's, it's a fantastically rewarding job that really takes very little of my time but it's also just a learning experience and an opportunity for me who you know preaches safe streets um, to get out there and kind of make it happen yeah yeah and how long have you been doing that now uh, just since the fall so this is okay. my first year and I signed on so I'll be doing it again next year so how long have you been engaged in this sort of advocacy work to striving to uh, make streets safer for everyone? Well, not that long. So this okay. is, um, I think, from January of 2020 um, at the, the Capitol building, the Safe Streets Forum, or I can't remember exactly what it's called, um, but I love this photo because it shows just how kind of awkward I was at this point because I was new to it all. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be in this picture. I thought like they were just taking a picture next to me because, you know, this is literally like these are some of the like the people that I look up to and are great. Um, and just was you know, kind of an honor to be amongst them uh, and doing what I can what I could do. Uh, I think the day before this too, um, Rob there in the front um, in the blue shirt, blue Denver Bicycle Lobby shirt, uh, Rob Toffness, um, and I had been on Nine News program 
um, talking about bike infrastructure. There we go. So this was like the day before that. Um, so yeah, that was when I realized like, oh, I'm all in. Like, I'm, it's just like, just, you know, everything that comes up, I'm like, yes, I will do that. Yes, I will. And this, I have to say, I drove to this because this was at the Nine News um, station um, right off the of spear. I was still kind of unsure about, you know, my, my bubble was still pretty small at this point. Again, this is 2020, um, early 2020, January, I believe. And I just did not feel safe getting over there by bike. Um, and then this was later in the day. I didn't know if I was going to hit rush hour traffic. And so, I, but I'm like, I don't, it doesn't matter. Like I'm, I'm going to go uh, and I want to be able to bike, but I can't. And that's part of the problem. That's part of why I'm here talking. Yeah, that's the story. So we've talked a little bit about the fact that um, a lot of changes have been happening. They're not happening as fast as we'd like to. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that Nine News there in, in Denver has, this isn't the first or only time that, you know, street safety has come up. I mean, it's, they're one of the, the media outlets that's doing a really, really good yeah. job with that. So Absolutely. And Steve Stager, who's in that photo with us, who yeah. interviewed us, is just amazing. And he, he kind of points out and shows up and it's so nice to have that voice that, yeah. you know, we feel like we don't really have yet, but he's able to kind of amplify and, and he rides his bike, he takes t- transit and he gets the, the need for safe streets. So it's really great having him and not only him, but other um, people in the media. And, and, and Denver does do a really good job of, of saying, of calling things uh, crashes, not accidents. Uh, and really trying not to kind of victim blame. I mean, we still get it occasionally, but right. I think we yeah. do a pretty good, our, our media does a pretty good job of that. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I think is is sort of eye-opening is when you sort of go down this rabbit hole of, you know, you, you talked about the story of, you know, being introduced to what's going on with, with Dutch cycling and that first time, you know, just sort of not even getting out on a bike and just kind of absorbing it. And then the slippery slope, that rabbit hole of, of like, oh, if this, then this. And so suddenly street safety becomes a, a much broader issue, even to the point of where we're, when you see this, you start to go, oh, yeah, I mean, all yeah. ages and all abilities and sidewalks and streets, you know, talk a little bit about this image and, and, and why you felt so compelled to, to share this as well. Yeah, well, I think really I became radicalized first as a pedestrian, just because, you know, you're trying to get around. I think this was, you know, when early on I did not bike in the winter, I, I, I had the big Dutch bike, which is fine in some cases, but it's very high and you're not, you don't have the stability. So I would walk to the grocery store, but I would encounter stuff like this. And a lot of this is from, you know, the, the streets getting plowed and dumped right into the crosswalk. Um, and it just yeah, I was going to say, this looks yeah. just like that. This looks like mm-hmm. the plow went through and sprayed yep. uh, chunky, icy stuff from the street onto a sidewalk, which most likely a resident uh, had had cleared in front of their property. Yeah. And that, you know, it, it, it is it is tough. Like a lot of our sidewalks aren't cleared because they are the responsibility of the resident. And, you know, we do have older residents or people who are out of town. So there's a lot of gaps in it. But then we also have, you know, people who are very responsible and come and clear this away. And then um, and then, yeah, the, a plow comes by and, and does this. I remember <laughs> once when I was I was eight months pregnant with my my youngest daughter living in Albany, New York, and um, it was out trying to keep my my three-year-old busy and plow and, and shoveling the sidewalk and a plow came through and just blocked everything. And like, just remember just feeling like crushed. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Like, Oh, I can't do any more of this. So it, it's, it's hard. Like we really, you know, and that's a part, another thing that I want people to realize, like we take care of the streets for the most part. Um, uh, and that's a public right away. Well, so are sidewalks, but we're, you know, we expect the homeowners and the businesses to be out there just constantly managing it. And it's, it's really, it's not, it's not the best way to kind of handle it. No, I think it's the, the, the most asinine <laughs> approach to, yes. uh, to, to the management of <laughs> well, what I was is trying actually, to be polite, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, I mean, when you consider it, I mean, it is considered the public right of way. 
Yeah. You know, it literally is considered the ROW. Mm-hmm. It's considered the right of way. It's considered Absolutely. public space. Um, uh, you know, even even though there's no sidewalks in front of my house, uh, technically I shouldn't do anything or build anything or plant anything uh, in that eight feet from the curb because it's not really ours. It's really considered the right of way and, and, and part of public space. And to me, it's just ridiculous that the city, uh, if there are sidewalks there, and by the way, typically the, the the city is is funding and building those sidewalks and if the sidewalk needs to be repaired it's usually out of the city coffers that that takes place uh, all the more reason that there should be a public maintenance schedule uh, to be able to to keep that snow plowed and keep it in out of disrepair you know keep it repaired and ready to go and we're looking at right here not a scene of snow and ice we're looking at just a completely you know miserable experience and it looks like it's a bus stop as well yeah. from a pedestrian right from a disability level. perspective yeah. yeah absolutely this is a walk audit that i went on um i think sponsored by denver park denver streets partnership uh, but yeah, friend Jamie there in a wheelchair, just kind of showing the issues that he has to deal with. And um, and even on the other side, there's a bit of a sidewalk, um, but it's really just kind of an extended curb. And he just said, like, I, I could not use that either, because if I go a little bit to the, you know, to the close to the edge, I could fall into the street. Um, so he ended up having to ride in the street. And this is on Quebec Street in Denver, which is not very, not very friendly at all. Um, as you can imagine by the picture, but and just kind of being able to see these issues um, through other people's eyes, through other people's experiences, um, just to kind of know, I mean, this is not a street that I would ever walk on, but if you have to take, if you have to take a bus, you don't have a choice, you know, like this is, this is where you have to go. Um, and, and just kind of the, those limitations and the inaccessibility um, just kind of, you never really see before until you see it and then you can't unsee it. Yeah. And, and, and I try to emphasize this too, is that, um, Protected bikeways and protected and separated cycle infrastructure is an empowering uh, network for people in mobility devices, in in wheelchairs. You will see whenever you experience those protected facilities in the Netherlands, uh, you will notice that they are occupied by people on mobility devices and in scooters and in uh, wheelchairs uh, because it is much easier for them to navigate and negotiate their city uh, in those facilities and it's very much welcome they're invited there and it, it's it's an empowering uh, facility for them um, because quite honestly in an older historic city the sidewalks are difficult for them to navigate and so I try to really kind of emphasize that because oftentimes one of the the voices that comes up in opposition of uh, protected bikeways and 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 things of this nature uh, end up being from you know you know confusingly from the disability community and it's like no 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 don't you understand this is what we mean by all ages and abilities is that it's for you too absolutely and and you know we all. We frequently get called ableists and, you know, ageists because people, you know, just assume that it's only going to be young, healthy people using these bikeways. But that's not who it's for. If, if that was, you know, if we were just building this infrastructure, for the people who were already using it already feel like kind of OK with using some of our dangerous streets and that would be fine. But we want to be able people to be able to be safe. Um, yeah. At all ages and abilities and, and be able to really make that choice to get out there without a car. Yeah, yeah. So, and I pulled this this photo up because mm-hmm. uh, this is a great example of, you know, a, a cycle track, a, a shared use path type of situation that, you know, it, it looks like is along a rail corridor here as well. And uh, again, this is a, a great opportunity that I think the Dutch really leverage quite well as, you know, in addition to the on-street network is they look for every opportunity, every corridor uh, along a canal, along a rail line, through a park. Uh, to be able to give a lower stress opportunity 
to be able to, to, you know, encourage active mobility, again, all ages and abilities. And, and that's Absolutely. why I love this. And I love this little, uh, Sam, yeah, I know. For, for I, yeah. Well, this is a, this is a great, uh, part of a network in San Luis Obispo where my youngest daughter goes to school. So whenever I'm there, I'm just taken to the roads and, and, and going out um, and exploring. And this is the railroad safety, um, trail, um, that goes from pretty much downtown to, uh, crosses over with a, this great pedestrian and bike bridge. And this goes out to a, a really great brewery down the road here a bit. But this connects also to a, um, a greenway in, in Slow and Morrow Street uh, that has diverters every couple of blocks. So um, kind of what we're trying to do with the Vamos project um, and just make a very low stress corridor for, for bicycles um, and pedestrians and and. And again, be a part of a network. And I think I think I might have one shot there of like kind of being on riding along the diverter. That that actually is City Park in New York and uh, here in Denver. In, in Denver, in, yeah, yeah. In Denver, and just kind of this was a free day, and it just kind of shows how cluttered our roads can be. We saw someone in a um, in a wheelchair trying to navigate this and mm-hmm. not being able to do it very successfully. So this is um, what connects to that railroad safety trail. Um, right. And it's the, the Morrow Street Greenway. Um, and so every couple of blocks, you'll see this and it's heavily used by, you know, by bicyclists. It's, it's so comfortable. I've only seen a cup, a handful maybe two or three cars on it and the dozens of times I've, I've ridden along it. Um, it's so comfortable. And this is what we are kind of pushing for in Denver um, as kind of more of a quick build way right. of, uh, and, you know, people still can park on the streets. That's still completely accessible. Um, you don't have to build miles and miles of uh, protected bike lanes. If, you know, if they're on these low stress, low volume streets to begin with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm going to pull up uh, bikestreets.com here in Vamos so that we can get a, a, a picture of that. Yeah, and when I came back from Amsterdam, that was the first thing that I, I found was Avi and Bike Streets mm-hmm. um, and went to the meeting and was just like that was kind of my, my start and met people from Denver Bicycle Lobby there. And yeah, it's just been the kind of the start of the progression. Yeah. And really the idea is um, what can you do quickly, lighter, quicker, cheaper, uh, to be able to create uh, an environment where we can take advantage of the incredibly extensive network of quiet residential streets that most cities have uh, if they were built uh, prior to World War II, if they were platted pr- prior to World War II, you have a, an incredible grid system that you can activate as quiet residential streets. And and again, I, I say this until I'm blue in the face that uh, even in the Netherlands, you know, 60 to 70 percent of their their network is considered some form of shared space. It, what gets the, the the attention in the news and the intention is is really the uh, the separated cycle paths and the protected bikeways, sure. but in reality, it's a lot of traffic calm streets. It's a lot of streets that where you are sharing some space, but the traffic volumes are down and the traffic speeds are down, Absolutely. and that's where these diverters come in. So that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, because we're we're working with our current network, which are not in many cases narrow streets. So we're we're having to calm it in other ways, and and they are in, in the in Amsterdam and other places in the Netherlands, they are kind of closing more streets to to traffic as well, just as that need comes. But uh, this is a way that we kind of thought this is relatively quick, easy, and kind of able to kind of make a template. And just use it over and over and over again and to really build out our network very quickly. It doesn't replace the need for protected bikeways, um, right. but it's a start. Um, and these, again, are on lower stress st- streets. And they're great for, you know, biking with families, which are difficult to do in, um, like, you know, narrow bike, way, bike lanes. So, yeah, we'll, we still need protected bikeways along uh along arterials, where the shops are, where you would, and like anyone would need to go, whether you're walking, riding, or or, or driving. But uh, this is a way that we can really kind of allow people to quickly and safely get out there, which has always been Avi's (laughs) Avi's goal. 
<laughs> well, it, it has been, and he's super, super passionate about it. And I really do encourage everybody, if you haven't had a chance to to watch that episode, to listen to that episode, please uh, head on over to the, the uh, Active Towns podcast and the Active Towns channel and uh, click through. And uh, yeah, it, it's it's a great one. It's a it's a, actually a long one. I think it's almost 90 minutes long. Uh, but, it, you know, Avi does a great job of talking about it and really... It's, it's not to be critical of what the city of Denver is doing. It's trying to bolster and, and accelerate the, the reality because if we have to wait for the hard stuff to get built, you know, the, the capital intensive projects of building, uh, you know, truly authentic, safe and inviting protected bikeways, it's going to be decades before it's done. And so this is a way to try to, uh, take the the concepts of traffic calming and traffic diversion and getting things in faster lighter quicker cheaper and faster and the, to your point, you know, relatively short distances, like being able to get over to spear um, it is it's not like it's that far and if you have the right tool like the shorty here um, it's also a very very doable and very comfortable ride. Um, But you have to have, you know, the feeling like you can splice together that route using some high comfort, uh, you know, streets as well as high comfort bikeways. Absolutely. And all it takes is one intersection to really kind of throw a monkey wrench into everything. So you could have like a nice little route, but then all of a sudden you're like, "Uh, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do here. And then yeah. Once you have that confusion, it kind of leads to conflicts. And I can, can I can yeah. think of a few of them there in Denver, and they're almost yeah. all part of the state uh, inventory mm-hmm. of Let's streets. That, you yeah. know, it's it's <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's Highway 287. Oh yeah, that's you know, and yeah. they they're masquerading as. Uh, as highways and streets at the same time, they're strodes, but they're technically not even the property of the city of Denver. They're actually owned and operated by uh, CDOT, the the Colorado Department of Transportation, which is also, when you look at the the realm of Department of Transportations uh, across North America, they're at least one of the more progressive but they're still they they're still car brain, you know. They're they're still prioritizing the movement of motor vehicles. Um, I, I wanted to, to focus on this photo just to simply say I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I missed a bike. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, so when I first got my e-bike, my husband was adamantly against it. He's like, "You don't need one." And at that time, I was maybe forty or fifty percent of my biking was was by you know or my travel was by bike mm-hmm. um, but my my lungs just couldn't do it my, you know especially in the heat and when our air quality was bad I, I ended up with a horrible case of bronchitis after not realizing the air quality was so bad and going out and one day coming back up from downtown from the Capitol building um, I started seeing stars it was hot it was um, You know, it was up this like we don't have too many hills, but it was uphill and I had to pull over and kind of get my vision back and thought, okay, I'm going home and I'm ordering the damn Um, (laughs) e-bike. And uh, my husband, again, was against it. And two months later, he had the shorty. Nice. So, <laughs> nice. Yeah. So he, he learned his lesson here. Um, but yeah, so we, yeah. we haven't really gone back and we were able to sell our second car, which yep. fully paid for, uh, which you know, the, the registration and insurance was coming due. And I had not driven my car, I think, but twice um, in about six months. And I was like, I'm not, I don't want to pay it. Let's sell yeah. it. And, yeah. and it paid for a bike for everyone, um, both my daughters and, um, and it, it 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 saved money in, yeah. in many ways and yeah. allowed us to go out on bike rides as a family. And just now I'm doing almost 100 percent of my travel by bike. Yeah. So it's, it's worth it in a lot of ways. Yeah, I love it. Nicole, what haven't we talked about that you really want to make sure we mention for the audience? Uh, let's see. I mean, we've covered a lot and I think yeah. I covered all the bikes. <laughs> right. I know. Exactly. Um, I guess that's you know, what I try to focus on um, in social media, like my, my, you know, the platforms. Twitter is very different than my Facebook, which is typically more friends and family. So I'll try to take things and dole out stuff to my friends. Oh, and this is uh, 
this election season, we did a lot of taking uh, candidates out on r- bike rides. And these are uh, some Brad Rivare, uh, Daryl Watson and Tim Hoffman, who uh, were all city council candidates. Um, two of them still are going to be in the runoff here. But just kind of and, and these are guys that kind of get it to begin with, but they just kind of want to come uh, and and take a ride around Park Hill and see what the issues were. And we just kind of pointed some stuff out, the good, the bad, the ugly. This is me taking um, two of my uh, neighbors. They wanted to know how to get to grocery stores. So we went to three different grocery stores in the area, just kind of showed them like, you know, quick little ways to, to get there, where how to park, how to block up. Uh, simple little things like that, that can kind of be a, a, an obstacle. But once you do it, you realize that you can do it. Uh, and is that your loaner bike or is that her bike? That is my loaner bike. Yep. Yeah. See, it's, you're putting it to work. Yeah. I know. It's, oh, it's, it's gotten, it's, yeah, I've, we've had it less than a year and it's gotten about 1400 miles on it so far. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And this, <laughs> this was uh, another issue, you know, like just trying to figure out how to manage in a world that's built for cars. This is a Walgreens drive through um, mm-hmm. And the reason I, I kind of put this up, it was very convenient because a lot of times I'll have packages in my bike to deliver. And then I'm on my way back. I'm with groceries and they did not have uh, any uh, bike racks. So I would use this if I had to pick up a prescription. Um, and I got warned that um, it was dangerous for me to do because a driver might not see me and would rear end me. And it just made mm-hmm. me think, why are you telling me this? <laughs> like, why aren't you telling the driver that they should watch for bicyclists. But, you know, it was one of those, like, again, like epiphany moments. Like, yeah, yeah that's not right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, just trying to kind of get people to to see not only how things are possible, but how our environment really dictates how we how we use that environment and, and the small changes even that could make a big difference. Um, so just trying to promote that and, and help people feel a little bit safer on the roads. There are things that we can do. I mean, a lot of our safety is not in our hands um, when you're when you're sharing space with big vehicles, but there are things that you can do like take the lane kind of um, and make yourself more visible. So just trying to kind of impart some of the things that I've learned in a very quick su- succession of how to kind of be out there and stay s- as safe as possible until we have that protected bike infrastructure. Uh, or, and or traffic calmed. Yeah. And traffic. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I try to emphasize that. Yeah. Is that if, if we're going to, if that's the, the barrier that or the, the threshold we're looking for is, oh, we're, we're not going to ride until everything is protected and separated. It's like, sorry, that's not going to happen. And it's also not realistic. And it's also not the reality of the Dutch experience, because again, more than half of their, uh, their experience is shared space. Um, but the the built environment there reinforces that the expectation is that is that the motor vehicle drivers are moving slowly and with care and with caution. And so there's layers of things that need to take place from the software perspective, as well as the orgware perspective. That's another term that I've heard recently is orgware and software and hardware. The hardware is our built environment. The software and the orgware are those uh, policies and procedures and laws and things that we can do to help with the cultural aspect of it, as well as the engagement activities like the Viva Streets and the other types of programming and uh, and folks that are volunteering as well as doing uh, amazing jobs such as being a crossing guard and, and helping things out. Uh, in your school, in your neighborhood, are there, have there been any uh, bike buses like uh, Sam Balto's bike bus there in the Portland area? No, and I'd love to be able to do that. Yeah. Of course, I am busy at the exact time that that at would the need exact to be going time, on. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I think I'm, I, there's a few people that I think I'm going to reach out to um, who maybe I can convince and help uh, in that in that regard. So I'm I'm hopeful. I think it would be phenomenal. There are quite a few um, kids who, who ride to school and parents. Um, we've seen an uptick for sure. I have like a little. I made a little. Uh, bike corral right in the front uh, where, where the drop off happens. Uh, and it, it's working really well. More and more people are, are, are using that because we've had a lot of construction in our area. So so the already tight parking has kind of gotten even tighter, which is not always a bad thing because it incentivizes other modes of travel. But yeah, I, w- I would love, you know, I'm just kind of, I didn't do too much this year because I was just kind of edging in, just want to 
kind of put my toes in the water and didn't want to like push things too much. But I definitely, as I've gone along, kind of tried to incentivize other things and, and think about what, what else can we do to, yeah, to yeah. prioritize that. Yeah. And so, and for members of the audience, if you're, if you're tuning in from, uh, the, the Denver Metro area, and if you haven't been up to Boulder to see, uh, Casey Middle School and Centennial Middle School, these are two middle schools that for decades now have had huge numbers of kids that, that ride their bikes, uh, to, to school. And, uh, it's, it's really quite encouraging because, you know, every day is bike bus day for them. They just, They've been doing it, uh, you know, since they they were in elementary school. And so um, it, and it's a combination of the fact that uh, there are some bikeways, but mostly it's the off street network and the uh, um, and, and some traffic calm streets, uh, residential streets uh, that really help feed into those two middle schools. And so just up the road uh, from me all there in the Denver metro area, Boulder has some really nice uh, schools that can be inspiration, uh, nice, you know, to yeah. get more kids on bikes. Bikes. Yeah. yeah. And, my and even in the high school Helgo, too, they, a, a lot Abs- of the, the kids. Yeah. Yeah. E- East high school, um, ha- which has a new protected bike way, very short, yes. but it's a, a yeah. crucial part. Um, usually the bike racks are, are, are packed. Uh, but, and then a, a friend, Alan Calgill, uh, a fellow, our co-founder of Denver bicycle lobby just started his own bike bus. Um, at oh, his did. Kids school. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. So nice. look out for that on, on Twitter. I think he has a video or a photo. Um, but so there are, there are places around Denver that are starting to do that. So I, I can't wait to see yeah. that, uh, happen. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to have to follow up with Alan about that and get him yeah. on the podcast. We've obviously profiled Sam Balto from uh, from the Alameda mm-hmm. School there in the Portland area, and uh, it's just so encouraging. Thank you so much for all that you are doing, Nicole, um, in your neighborhood. Uh, any advice that you would have for for other, you know, community members, other moms, other adults, parents, whatever, that, you know, are, are just concerned with, you know, making their cities, their neighborhoods a, a, a little, you know, safer and more inviting for all ages and abilities. Any, any pearls of wisdom, you know, now that you're a good three yeah. years plus in. <laughs> I this. Know. Uh, you know, I don't know about pearls of wisdom, but I would just say get involved, like be on, you know, sign up for newsletters with uh, your local agencies that let, let you know when these activities are happening, support them, um, you know, complain. If your grocery store doesn't have, bike parking, then talk to the management, see if you can get that done. You know, there's, there's things I'm constantly writing three, one, one reports based on safety issues that I see things like that get recorded. Um, you know, it can't hurt. Uh, and I've documented issues and, and, you know, little things like that. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of time to do that, but mainly it's just get out, get out there, try to, to, to do, you know, get around without a car, see what the issues are. If you, you know, find issues, then contact someone and, and say, you know, how can, how can we make this better? I, I've managed to get some lights signals changed in my area. It only took two and a half years <laughs> of writing and complaining, but it happened. <laughs> so, you know, things like that, that little differences can really make a big difference. You know, if, if, if you're that within, in the case of that, our, uh, our light was a demand actuated light and wasn't getting triggered by people waiting on a bike. So you would just have to wait indefinitely or go right up on the sidewalk and press a button or wait for a car to trigger it. So things like that, that maybe people aren't aware of that is an issue, but uh, could, can easily be changed in most cases yeah. after two yeah. and a half years. of complaining. Yeah. And, and folks, if you're active out on Twitter, please, you know, follow Nicole out there again. Uh, her handle is uh, at Going Dutch D E N uh, on Twitter, and you do a really good job of uh, mixing in, you know, some of the challenging moments as well as the inspiring moments. And and I think that that's that's really important, right? Is to a be persistent. Mm-hmm. Um, Try to be positive as much as you can. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you have to vent, you have got to vent a little bit. Um, any 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 wisdom, you know, from from the last three plus years of, you know, handling, you know, those those kind of frustrating things of it taking longer than it should. How, how, how do you kind of keep your spirit up, given the fact that stuff doesn't happen as quickly as it should? 
Yeah, I think I think giving you uh, giving yourself permission to take a step back sometimes because I think all of us deal with that kind of frustration and overload and just kind of needing to take that little break and that's fine like take that break and and one thing that I do even when I'm complaining on Twitter I try to say well how how will this how can we make this better so it's not just the complaint like we need this um, you know just trying to to make it more of a more of a positive than a negative I don't want to just complain and it's and it's it's something I've learned a lot it's not a lot of times that the, the anger or frustration is directed at drivers, but they're really just using the infrastructure as they've been told they can use it. Um, so, it, it, you know, trying to realize like what improvements could ha happen to make everyone safer, not just people walking and biking, but for drivers too. Yeah, yeah. And having a good balance of, of you know, that advocacy work. So if you're out on Twitter and you're, 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 you're pushing for change and you're getting stuff out there, balance it with some, with a few images like this. So that it brings a smile. Yeah, to exactly. Well. <laughs> but who doesn't like to see a happy smiling dog? <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been such a joy and pleasure for me. Thank you so much for all that you do too. And, 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 and amplifying our voices and kind of uh, showing showing better ways that could you know things that can happen and uh, you know just kind of living our lives uh, and with a goal in mind and, and showing showing that that's a possibility and a necessity in many cases. Yeah, well, you are quite welcome. And yes, together we can make this happen. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this episode with Nicole. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>